Hello everyone and welcome to Hill Street. Today's story is, I was a guard at an underground facility where secrets were buried. If you end up enjoying this story, please leave a like. And if you enjoy hearing stories from me, please subscribe and become a resident of Hill Street and let me know how I'm doing in the comments. Now, let's get to this nightmare. After this, I'm going off grid after I speak the truth. I joined the army on my 18th birthday, a boy from a small town who was half a measure excited and half a measure terrified as the truck packed with recruits pulled up outside the gates of the compound that was to be our home for basic training. I remember it all so clearly. The moment when I piled out of the back of the truck the sight of hut stretching as far as my eyes could see, the scowl on the face of the man who would become my tormentor and inspiration, Drill Sergeant Mallory. He was a 30-year veteran who looked and acted like he started his day sitting in a bath of scalding hot water, bringing his temper to the boil and reddening his grizzled face. His first words to me were, I hate you. This I soon realized was nothing personal. It was just the first step in breaking us down so he could build us back up. Ten weeks later, on the day we shipped out at the end of our basic training, I stood on the parade ground and saluted him with respect and gratitude in my heart. I had no idea where I was headed, for as we set off a few hours later, I suspected I was still too green, but hope my destination would be one of the conflict zones that my country had its finger in, not officially at war, but with boots on the ground and bristling for a fight. After a day's long hard ride, we finally ground to a halt. The NCO yelled at us to get our butts out of the truck, and we're only too glad to oblige, stepping out and seeing hills, not a military airport not a waiting troop ship, but a scrawny looking set of hills that stretched to the horizon. There was no sign of civilization, just the road we had driven in on and our small group milling around. My comrades' disappointed expressions mirrored my own. I rubbed my chin and cracked a joke about ordering a pizza. No one laughed, especially the NCO who had undergone the sense of humor removal procedure required for promotion to this elevated position. An officer appeared, where from I did not see, and while we hurried to stand to attention and salute, he looked us up and down, then addressed us. Gentlemen, welcome to your new post. I can see two things from your faces, that the cousins in your family are romantically entangled and that you're not where you expected to be. Well, tough. This is the hand you have been dealt and your country demands that you rise to the occasion. Before I go any further, I need to make something very clear. Everything you see, everything you hear, every damn thing that happens from this moment is subject to absolute deniability. And for anyone who does breathe a word of this, I guarantee you, a life sentence in a military prison. There will be no trial first, no jury. Do you understand? He looked at us. We stared back dumbfounded. The NCO repeated the question, screamed it at us. Do you understand? Yes, we finally managed to spit out. Do you understand? Yes, we roared. Suitably warned and completely ignorant, we were led by the officer towards a rock face that opened before us. Cool, Private Wells whispered. Wells was a country boy with ears that stuck out and a skinny neck. He loved comic books and monsters and had somehow become my best friend. As for me, my heart was beating really fast as we passed through the opening. I was pure and simply excited. I could not see the ground in front of my feet. If I had, 
I would not have been surprised to see that it was stamped with the words, Top Secret. Here I was, Billy from Backwaters, William Pointer Jr. on my signing up papers, on the verge of discovering a cave, a big brightly lit cave. Cool, Wells whispered, as we stared up and around the vast area we had emerged into. The officer wheeled, faced us. This is the reception area, he told us. It is monitored by cameras, movement and heat detectors. At this moment in time, you are in line of fire of two dozen automatic guns, one sweep of which would reduce us all to a bloody gore. To a man, we tensed. At the edges of this area are three main conduits which lead to storage areas. There are secondary conduits which lead to living quarters. You'll be taken to yours now. Before then, are there any questions? I don't know why I opened my mouth. Why the words, what is being stored here, came out. But they did. Even Wells did not want to look at me then. The officer walked up to me. If we had been from a certain northern clime, we would have been close enough to rub noses in a friendly greeting. As it was, I could feel his breath on my face as he said, Do you want your mama to open her porch door in the morning and find a bag of gore with your name tag tied to it? No, sir, I replied, and lived to screw up another day. Our initial period at the faculty which was the only name we had ever heard it given, were taken up with the mindless routine so beloved of armies around the world. We cleaned, we drilled, we were inspected, and in between we were inducted into our new world. I say new world because that is what it felt like to me. The only light was artificial, and the air tastes stale. We were permanently underground, sounds carried like the gentle rumble of thunder in the distance from the various tunnels to wherever we were posted on guard duty. Conduit was army speak for tunnels, and as we rotated from post to post, we learned the storage areas the three main tunnels led to were numerous and reached deep into the earth. After two months at the facility, I had the feeling I had still only seen a fraction of it. As for the question I had been stupid enough to ask on my first day here, I could only wonder. About twice a week a new shipment arrived, packed in steel crates on the backs of lorries, which were driven to one of the storage areas, all under watchful eye of armed guards. We speculated of course in our bunks watching smoke spirals from our cigarettes drift lazily up. Private Wells' favorite theory was that the crates contained aliens who had crash-landed on this planet and the remains of their spaceships along with radioactive monsters, possibly giant gators or car-sized cockroaches. In the humble opinion of Private William Jointer Jr., well, sir, I reckon the crates contain deadly viruses, hard drives containing classified data, compromising photographs of politicians, and the like. The dirty secrets no government would want to see the light of day of. If I was right, there were a lot of secrets buried down here, a hell of a lot. But I believe there is no government anywhere in the world that does not mass-produce scandalous, illegal and downright dangerous materials as a matter of course. For us in the rank and file, it did not matter at the end of the day. As long as we could stand up straight for hours on end holding a rifle and jump on command, then the world kept turning in the same old way. Or so, I thought, until that nightmare day. It began like any other, far too early, with an NCO reminding us just how far down the food chain we were as we dragged ourselves out of our bunks. Whatever it had once been, our breakfast was something that had been beaten and fried 
into a shapeless lump, and then we were assigned post and marched there double quick. Wells and I were among those ordered to stand guard, while a newly arrived lorry unloaded its crate in one of the storage areas. The crate itself could not have been more than six foot by six, small by comparison to others we had seen, and there was six of us soldiers watching over it, rifles held at the ready. It must be gold dust, I whispered to Wells. He suggested ground up Martians in reply. Whatever it was, the unloading crew clustered around the lorry were taking their time. I caught sight of one or two worried looks among them. They know what's in there, I thought, and it's got them nervous. The straps on the lifter grew taut and began to haul the crate into the air. To this day, I don't know what happened, whether the crate was not secured properly or if there was a flaw in the material of the straps, but the crate suddenly tipped down to one side and fell to the ground. A heartbeat later, one of the unloader boys called out, RUN! I grabbed gawking Private Wells by his collar and began to sprint away. We made it out of the storage area and into a tunnel before the explosion came. Dust filled the space where we stood and there was a moment of silence. The explosion caused by whatever was in that damn crate had been sudden and extreme. Shielding our faces as best we could with our sleeves, Wells and I moved cautiously back towards where the tunnel had opened out into the storage area and saw that it was now completely blocked by fallen earth. I had the sickening feeling that, beyond this blockage, the storage area was buried under fallen earth, the storage area, and the rest of the poor souls who had been in there. I became aware of a siren. It seemed very far away, and that Wells was saying something to me, but I could not make out what it was because of the ringing in my ears. He held up one hand and made the universal sign asking if I was okay. I nodded, then coughed up dust. It must have been less than a minute later that we were joined by other soldiers, among them an officer. The expression on his face confirmed my worst fears. A tragedy had happened here, a terrible accident. I thanked my lucky stars I had survived and tried to hear what was being shouted. My hearing was still affected and I was beginning to shake. Delayed shock, I guessed. Around me other men were acting. They were digging at the solid wall formed by fresh fallen earth with their bare hands and calling out if anyone could hear them. I thought it would be a miracle if anyone had survived, but kept this to myself and told myself to get a grip. I stepped forward and began to tear away lumps of earth. I had barely gotten started when an order was yelled to move away. A digger truck trundled into sight behind us and began to advance on the wall of fallen earth. We stood and watched, and there was more than one bowed head, one pair of hands clasped together. Then there was a crackling sound. I turned to see the officer listening to the radio intently. We need to pull out, men, he said, then walked alongside the truck and relayed the orders to the driver, who looked frustrated but did not argue. None of us did. We followed our orders. Without question, I should be able to say as a good soldier, but whatever flaw in me that made me ask what was stored here showed again. Why are we pulling out, sir? I asked. This time I was not given a dressing down. The officer looked at me, and I could see the concern in his eyes as he replied. There have been secondary collapses, son. There are chemical substances leaking into the site of the explosion. So we need to leave, but don't worry. There are troops on the way with hazmat equipment, 
And even as he said this, soldiers wearing the bulky safety suits rushed past us towards the wall of earth. His radio crackled again, and he walked on as he answered it. I fell into step alongside Wells. He was shaking his head. Man, Billy, he said. Secret chemicals and dead bodies. You know what that adds up to. No, I said. Man, Billy, he went on. We got ourselves a recipe for disaster. Wells was my friend and a good person, but his obsession with the things that excited in the pages of his comic books had gotten the better of him. I thought, until I heard the first scream, I froze. It was not the sound of man in shock or pain. It was a cry of terror. Wells, meanwhile, was on the move. His rifle raised in front of him. He ran towards where the screams had come from, back to the wall of earth. Reluctantly, I followed. We were met by a chaotic scene. Half a dozen soldiers in hazmat suits were standing, staring in apparent shock at one of their comrades, whose face was pressed against the wall of earth. It was like he was being held there. What happened? I shouted at one of the suited soldiers. His voice was muffled beneath his headgear, but I thought I heard him say, it reached out from the dirt, grabbed a hold of him, which made no sense to me. Wells, meanwhile, had continued to advance until he was close enough to tap the man pressed against the wall of earth on the shoulder. When he did, the man began to shake, then flew backwards at pace. He landed on his back and looked down with horror where his headgear was torn open at the bloodied site where his face should have been. His flesh was torn away, almost as it had been bitten off. Billy, watch out! Wells cried. I looked up, saw the hands reaching out, and the face protruding from the wall of earth. What the hell? I spluttered, and could only stand there gripped by fear as the thing struggled free of the wall of earth to stand there, swaying until it bared its teeth and with shocking speed threw itself at Wells. A volley of bullets exploded from Wells' gun, tearing into the thing's head until it collapsed onto its knees, then fell forwards. I gasped for breath that would not come and for the first time realized the thing was wearing a soldier's uniform, the same as mine, the same as Wells, who spat onto the ground and whispered, Shit. Put the rifle down! Someone yelled from behind us. I turned. It was the officer, flanked by soldiers, all whom were aiming their weapons at Wells. No, I said. It was attacking him. Stand down, son, the officer said. I think you need to listen to my friend. This was from Wells whose attention was focused on the wall of earth from which the thing had emerged, from which more hands were now appearing, fighting through the earth, and within seconds three more men stepped out into the open. They too wore our uniform, and I recognized all three as men from our unit, men who surely died in the collapse caused by the explosion, men who were clearly no longer human. Their faces were twisted with rage, and a low growling sound drifted from their mouths, and they were advancing on us. Wells raised his gun once more, ready to fire. Lower your weapon, the officer said. He sounded unsure, scared. Wells shouted back. Better you give the order to open fire on me, then I let one of these dead critters get their teeth into me. Dead and moving, with anger burning in their eyes, I knew what I had to do. I turned and aimed my own weapon at the officer. Sir, we have a common enemy here. Those things are no longer our comrades. They are monsters and we need to take them out. Ice cold sweat trickled down my face as I spoke. 
The rifle shook in my hands. The officer hesitated. Moments that cost my friend his life. Wells delayed opening fire until it was too late. He took out one of the things. A second dug its teeth into his shoulder, the third into his throat, and he fell to the ground with both of them on top of him. I ran to him and battered at the thing's heads with the butt of my rifle. The officer finally ordered, Help him! Get those things off him! And I was joined by the rest of the soldiers. Within moments, the heads of the dead were reduced to a pulp and their twitching bodies dragged away. I knelt over Wells. He looked up at me. Tears streamed down his face, mingling with his blood. I could see the bone beneath where the flesh had been bitten away. He tried to speak. I'm here, I said. Help's on the way. I glanced back at the officer, who was talking into his radio. Wells tried to speak again. I supported the back of his head with my hand and moved closer so I could hear. Put a bullet in my brain, Billy, he said. Please do it. If you don't, I'll become one of them. I can't, I sobbed. I'm sorry. I looked into his eyes as he died and he fell still. I felt a hand on my shoulder. We will look after him. It was the officer. I held Wells close to my chest. No, I said. Then two soldiers took my arms and pulled me away. I struggled, but could not resist. They held me down as more soldiers descending on Wells, and started to strap together his ankles and wrist, gagged his mouth. He's dead, you bastards, I shouted. Leave him alone. They ignored me, lifted Wells' body, and sudden spasm passed through it, and it began to writhe. I began to weep and watched as the soldiers carried the struggling corpse away. I'm crying now as I recount this. I should have done what Wells asked, placed my gun against his head, and pulled the trigger. I have thought about this constantly for the last two years, while I was being debriefed, and in the time I spent in a secure medical faculty, following a nervous breakdown and after I was discharged. During my treatment, I realized I was being led to believe that there were no dead who came back, that I thought this because of an illness induced by witnessing the explosion. Survivor's guilt, they called it. False memories. But I know what I experienced, and I believe I know what happened to the body I saw carried away. There is a tunnel that opens out into an area deep underground where a crate holds imprisoned a monster that is dead and will never be at peace. A monster that was once a man I called my friend.